Hey, friends and listeners of the Switch for Good podcast. Yep, that's you. I have some really exciting news. Dotsie and I have started a Switch for Good podcast Facebook group. We created it so we can build a community of fans that will help us improve the show and deliver on the topics that you want to learn more about. So we want to hear what your favorite content is, what you want more of, and what you want less of. And if you like the length of the show, Dotsie and I are always talking about the length of the show, right, Dotsie? Yes. We want to tailor our show around the needs and desires of our incredible listeners, almost half a million of you. And it's really simple to join. Just go to our Switch for Good Facebook page, that's Switch, the number four, and then Good, and then click on Groups. And there we are, the Switch for Good podcast chat. You can post directly in the group, share ideas, talk to other listeners, and connect with like-minded folks. So go, run, join our Facebook group, and tell us what you want. Hello and welcome, everyone, to the Switch for Good podcast. I'm Alexandra Paul, and I'm here with my co-host, Dotsie Bausch. Hi, Dotsie. Hello, everyone, and hello, Alexandra. (laughs) So today, Dotsie... um, I wanted to read the second in the Her Story series because it fits so well with our guest today, Wayne Shung, who fights for animals with such passion and persistence and dedication and is such a powerful speaker on the subject. It's so apt that I read this story, um, which is by Natalie Blanton. And... um, it's another in, in the series, Her Story. So I'll just, just start. Okay. I remember their eyelashes, big dark doe eyes encased by long, wispy, soft curled lashes on their demure black and white bovine faces. Newborn calves were kept in a teeny tiny pen alone. And as a young child, I was fascinated by these baby creatures. I thought it was quaint that they had their own little space their own, their very own tiny house with a front yard. I grew up in rural Utah and had friends who lived on pastoral dairy farms, you know, the kind found beaming across every carton of milk. Sure, I mean, I knew cows lived there and I knew milk and cheese came from them. However, the exact mechanics of how eluded me. As I matured and after enough games of hide and seek, among those rows of sheds housing tiny young calves, I started to piece together a more sinister cycle taking place. It was a gradual tugging on threads of understanding, an unraveling of a dark truth behind those happy cows on those happy milk cartons. As the winter melted away and spring emerged, new baby cows could be found hobbling about the farms, taking their first steps under the guidance of their mothers. My excitement turned sour as I got older and I began to notice those spiked nose rings piercing through these day old calves noses. Hungry for their mother's milk, the spike stabbed her udders, leaving them unable to feed and bond. After a few days of this process, the calves were taken away from their mothers permanently. I will never forget the screams from the mothers and the cries from the babies in response. These babies would now be held across the farm, shackled inside a veal crate, though I didn't know yet what veal meant. In my early teen years, I became a rodeo queen, a rural rite of passage for gritty yet glamorous young cowgirls. Among other responsibilities of a newly minted rodeo queen, I was tasked with judging 4-H cattle at the annual county fair. I watched in awe as preteen kids paraded their animal across the arena, radiating with pride. They hugged their animals, named them endearing pet names like Daisy or Buddy, and watched as their animal was auctioned off later in the night, sold by the currency of their weight in flesh. I then watched as these same children broke down in sobs while loading their pets onto the slaughter truck. Curiosity got the best of me and I wanted to know why these cows, 
the ones with brown and black fur without spots, were the meat cows, and the Holsteins, the ones with the iconic black and white spots, were allowed to live longer as dairy cows. I asked a nearby rancher there at the fair and he scoffed, saying, spots or not, they all end up at a feedlot. And later in my teen years, I discovered a mysterious contraption on my friend's family farm that looked like a medieval torture device. I wasn't far off. The colloquial industrial term for this device is a rape rack, and it is used to impregnate dairy cows so they can produce milk. Contrary to popular belief, cows don't produce milk on the day to day. Like all mammals, they have to give birth before they start lactating. This discovery shook me as I had recently survived my own experience of sexual assault. I knew that what had happened to me was not okay and it should never happen to anyone, ever. As a woman and a budding feminist, I was learning the urgency and vitality of bodily autonomy and consent. I couldn't compute that this industry wholly revolves around the commodification and the exploitation of a mammal's reproductive system. Because, lest we forget, we are merely mammals ourselves. What I have learned is this. Dairying is not a reciprocal relationship. People can love cows and still send them off to slaughter. Cows do not endlessly lactate. They must be impregnated and give birth and the device used to induce pregnancy is called a rape rack. Cows do not explode if they are not milked and in the natural world, their babies would drink their milk, but they can't because they are taken away within days of birth. Two, one, follow in the footsteps of their mother or two, be turned into veal. That farmer was right. Spots or not, they all end up at the feedlot. So um, thank you to Natalie Blanton for submitting that to Switch for Good. Um, so I really want to introduce our guest now because mm -hmm. I think if this story has moved you, he will inspire you to, be, to make some movement in your own life towards helping animals. So one of the great things about having your own podcast is you can invite people you respect and love in your own life on they, whom you want to share with uh, your audience. And Wayne Shung is one of those people. He is a dear friend of mine. He's a man I greatly admire and who he actually just might be the smartest person I know because when I asked him for a book recommendation, he came back with this, this tome that was 600 pages long. I did not read that one, but I have read several others that he's recommended. Um, Wayne Shung is a lawyer and a co-founder of Direct Action Everywhere, which is also known as DXC. DXC is an animal rights network based in Berkeley, California, with more than 50 active chapters around the world. And I am a devoted member. Wayne studied behavioral science at the University of Chicago and at MIT, and was a corporate lawyer for one of the largest law firms in the world. DXC is known for its open rescue tactics that have rescued hundreds of animals from factory farms, labs, and slaughterhouses. Its graphic videos from inside factory farms have garnered hundreds of thousands of online views and its public demonstrations bring thousands of activists into the streets. DXC was instrumental in getting the California fur ban passed and is determined to bring about animal liberation in one generation. Wayne also has his own podcast called The Green Pill. He's also facing numerous felony and misdemeanor charges for his animal activism, but He's taking the time to speak with us today. Welcome, Wayne, to the Switch for Good podcast. I'm so happy to have you on. I'm excited to be here. I'm, I'm, I've heard great things about Dotsie, and it's the first time I get to chat with her, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. So let's, I'd love people to learn a little bit about your childhood and what got you from there to, to hear where you are now, which is a leader in the animal rights movement and really someone who's brought back some tactics 
brought to the fore tactics like open rescue that really weren't heretofore seen in the United States that have been incredibly successful in moving people's view of animals and how we should treat them uh, to, uh, well, a much more progressive place. So tell us a little bit about your childhood. How did your experiences shape your fierce belief in animal rights? Yeah, I mean, I think there were two things. One is I, I grew up with two parents who didn't speak a lot of English. And I was born here shortly after they moved to Indiana, which is not the best place with Chinese immigrants. Um, it ended up being a good place for me. And I'm not saying there aren't amazing people there, but there were like five families in the Chinese community in, in central Indiana when I was growing up. And, and so there is a real profound sense of dislocation. We're trying to integrate and assimilate into a community we don't understand, you know, go to a church, learn about football, figure out what a burger is and adopt dogs, you know? And in China, where my parents grew up and in Taiwan, Dogs and cats really weren't seen as companions. They were seen as guards. You know, you have a guard dog or a cat you might have for kind of preventing infestations of mice and rats, but you don't really have them as family members. And so, for example, when my parents were growing up, not many people had dogs. The people who had dogs wouldn't usually let them in their homes. Um, so it was, it was kind of part of the culture shock to see for my parents the way Americans seem to care for and love their animals. But the reason that was particularly important for me is because I just didn't have many friends when I was growing up, you know. Um, and, you know, I have one older sister who's four years older than, than me, way better looking and more popular and, and, and cool than I am. So she had friends. And, and honestly, I think that the experience of Asian women and integrating is a little different than the experience of Asian men. It's mm -hmm. many ways harder for Asian men to integrate because as bad as a lot of the horrible stereotypes are of Asian people, because a lot of those stereotypes relate to femininity and quietness and, you know, like girls often have a better time. I mean, it, it, at least in some ways, they're, they're obviously awful things and we're seeing nationwide what's happening to Asian women with the violence. But at least in school, my sister had a much better time, had friends and I really didn't. So my outlet was animals. You know, the neighbors would have dogs in their yards. I'd always play with them. I, I feel like I had this almost genetic predisposition for animals and that from my earliest memories, when I was a toddler and a child, I see an animal and immediately go towards them. And I never had any fear towards them, which is very strange because I'm not, I don't think I'm an unusually courageous person in most regards when it comes to animals. Even when I was a little kid, my mom is terrified of snakes. If you even say the word snake, I mean, she could collapse and start, <laughs> you know, she would start shivering and get scared just the thought of snakes. But you know, whether it was snakes, reptiles, I loved dinosaurs as a kid, the animals were my friends. And I think it has a lot to do with just Dr. Seuss books and cartoons you watch as a kid and the fact that I didn't have any friends. But the second experience I had, and, and this is really the important one, was in the United States, we're very separated from farm animals in particular. You know, 100 years ago, I think 50% of the population lived on a farm. Now it's 1% or less of our population lives on a farm. 100 years ago, the stockyards of Chicago were right in downtown, you know, and, and it was a slaughterhouse capital of the nation. Upton Sinclair wrote The Jungle in 1912 or something like that, triggering, uh, you know, the first federal action against slaughterhouses. And, and when he talked about the slaughterhouses, they're on 35th Street, not very far from where I lived in Chicago as a young law student, law professor, and then eventually lawyer. Those stockyards are all gone you're not going to find an urban area with a massive slaughterhouse any longer because no one wants to live near them. And because they've increased in size and in just kind of the industrial nature of them, that no one wants to be anywhere near them. Like you do not want to live near a modern slaughterhouse. It stinks. It pollutes. It makes the local community sick. And so most Americans, even those who have an interest in animals, whether it's, you know, an interest that's academic or an interest as an activist have never been close to a factory farm or a slaughterhouse. In China, that's not true. You know, when we went back to my, my homeland, you know, in, I think it was uh, 1989 for the first time, because my family had been separated from our family members in 1949 for 40 years. And 40 years later, we went back um, because of a civil war in China that split the nation in two. And a bunch of people fled, including my, most of my family. But a lot of our family members were left behind and went back to see them. And went back to these, you know, ancestral homelands. And 
even in these big urban metropolises and even in cities like Beijing and Shanghai, you're still going to see animals. And you can see this in Chinatown today. Like you go to a Chinatown in the United States and they talk about the wet markets. A lot of people have wet markets in their mind right now because of the pandemic. Well, they're everywhere. And so when I went back for the first time as an eight-year-old kid who desperately loved animals, and I really do mean desperate, like I had this intense attachment to animals, I saw animals in cages. I saw animals screaming in fear and agony as they're being slaughtered for the first time in my life. And it shook me up in a really deep and fundamental way. Because one of the animals I saw in a cage was a dog. And that dog was going to end up on somebody's plate. Mm -hmm. So that's the beginning. And your dad, interestingly, and I hadn't known this uh, until I was doing research for this, um, for this uh, interview with you, is he also was, yeah. yeah, he tested on animals. Yeah, he did. I mean, and, and, and he, you know, my dad is one of the, you know, just a profoundly good human being, incredibly generous person. When there are family members or friends in central Indiana who needed any help, he, he would always, I mean, he's the sort of person who will just give you the shit off his back if you ask him for it. Uh, but he heard animals, a lot of animals. And he did this partly because his upbringing was one where animals weren't really a part of his life. You know, he was born in China, fled with his family at the age of two on a boat across the Taiwan, straight to Taiwan, and lived in poverty in Taipei, you know, like a very dense urban environment where the only exposure to animals was at a wet market right before they were gonna be killed. But then when he got to grad school in the United States, the thing they were, they're all taught, and he was an organic chemistry PhD student, is this is why things done and you have to do it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, back then, some of the things he talks to me about are just absolutely brutal. I mean, the, so nowadays we have forms of, humane euthanasia in labs like using gas which honestly is not as humane as that sounds i mean it's it's gasking an animal and it, it often causes respiratory spasms but back then they weren't even using gas i mean so like one of the common ways they harvest organs from rats and mice was just decapitation with scissors they take a sharp pair of scissors grab a mouse and just have to cut their heads off with the scissors and so you know and then he went on to work for a pharmaceutical company called eli Lilly for a few decades researching metabolic disease, which I'm sure you all know about, and it's really important for us to do research on diabetes and metabolic disease and obesity. But the way they did it was, you know, messing with animals in really disturbing, disgusting ways. And so, you know, my dad, when I was a kid, would bring him photographs of animals that they were experimenting on. And you know, some of these animals would be like, you know, I don't remember the exact animals, and this was a long time ago, but I remember like pigs that were morbidly obese, dogs and cats that had weird tumors on them and just all sorts of grotesque experiments. And because my dad had for years, decades at that point, been desensitized to the violence against animals that pervades our society, for him, it was just a scientific curiosity. And he thought, I'm sharing this with my child because I want him to learn and understand mm -hmm. how obesity works, how metabolic disease works. And it was so bizarre. And you know, animal rights activists say all this all the time. We know these animals are close enough to us that we recognize that we can experiment on them to find various scientific conclusions. And we don't realize they're close enough to us that their suffering actually matters. That the pain they feel from diabetes and obesity and cancer is the same pain we feel. And my dad didn't make that connection at the time and thought I can show my kid this research and he's not gonna be affected, but it profoundly affected me. I mean, I was scared and I, I, was, I was angry and I wanted to do something about it, but I was also an eight year old kid and not particularly confident in myself at the time. Um, so I didn't do much. Yeah. So you have this <clears throat> extraordinary uh, connection and, and, and deep love for animals. And you went to law school and you got involved in, in animal welfare. Um, you thought though at that time that animal rights was a bit too extreme. <laughs> Why did you, wh why and when and how and all of those, did you decide that, that animal welfare was simply not enough? Yeah, you know, it's funny you asked me that question because I'm sitting here now and a lot of people in the animal rights movement know me as this guy who is facing 16 felonies, organized all these protests and disruptions, whether it's in grocery stores or in factory farms. But my earliest experiences with campaigns, I, I, when I was a University of Chicago student 20 years ago, I was the one who was saying, we cannot protest because it is irresponsible, unethical, and putting too much pressure on local businesses. I, I mean, there's emails. I wish I could go back and read all the emails, but I used to say, 
this is going to make us look bad. We can't protest. That's not the right thing to do. Like, I just didn't believe in any form of protest activism. Um, and, and yeah, when I went to law school, I, I went with the intention of doing very kind of reformist institutional activism. There was a law professor at the time who's now at Harvard, but at the time was at the University of Chicago named Cass Sunstein. He's the most cited law professor in the world and one of the most prominent academics in legal history, frankly. And I, I thought I'm going to work with this guy. And he had a, a program that he was starting at the time called the Chicago Project on Animal Treatment Principles, which is all about how we just got to tell people what's actually happening and the world will slowly change. So let's use you know, neoliberalism and capitalism and consumer information to drive change through people's pocketbooks. And, and that's what I thought I was going to do. Uh, but that changed dramatically. And I think, honestly, a couple of things. One is uh, well, just to be bluntly honest, one is my failure as an academic. I was not a very good professor and not a very good academic. And, you know, I never got tenure. So I needed to find another avenue for my life. But second and more importantly, you know, when I started diving deeper into the academic research on how change actually happens, and once you start conceiving of animal rights as a social justice movement, and not just the consumer movement, it's not just, you know, it absolutely is about our diets, it's about our habits, it's about our health. It's also about the fact that there are trillions upon trillions of sentient beings in the wild and in factory farms and in laboratories who are suffering in ways that we cannot imagine. To the point that Steven Pinker, probably the most optimistic intellectual, public intellectual about the future of human civilization, has said, my one exception to my general optimism about the state of the human race is the way we treat animals. <laughs> and there are many thoughtful people who say the same that we've made so much progress in so many areas. You know, we understand that racism is wrong. We, we, we have a movement now against sexual harassment. We believe that regardless of your orientation, you should be treated with respect and dignity and love. We should cherish all forms of human beings. When it comes to the animals of this earth, we treat them like worse than garbage, worse than garbage. Uh, and recognizing that and, and d diving deeper into the research into how large societies have shifted these cultural attitudes towards the status of marginalized peoples and now animals too, convinced me that, you know, kind of the piecemeal incremental approach, while it still has a lot of merit and I'm glad people are doing that work, is not enough. To create the momentum you need to drive systemic social change, you need a political movement. But the third factor, so there's, you know, my failure as an academic, the research I was doing in social movements, reading about people like Erica Chenoweth, reading about people like Zainab Tufekci, the Turkish sociologist, who uh, is now a New York Times columnist, who's done so much work on the Arab Spring and Me Too and all these great movements over the last 10 years. But the third factor was visiting a slaughterhouse for the first time and just walking in there and seeing the animals and understanding just how desperate it is for them. You know, every single moment that we wait to achieve animal rights and animal liberation is a moment where there's some poor suffering animal, just like, you know, the poor beagle behind me who is desperately crying out for solace, needs to be liberated from that cage, needs to be saved from a blade that is inches from her neck. And, and that, is, that is time that can't be wasted. And urgency that not only did I personally feel it, I realized if I could just replicate the feeling that I'm experiencing right now, if I could show people, I mean, the best scenario is for them to feel the way this cow feels, the way this poor little calf, because the first slaughterhouse I walked into was a veal and lamb slaughterhouse. So these are baby animals, adorable animals. I mean, Alexandra has spent a lot of time with cows. She knows these are beautiful creatures that across all cultures, you see a baby cow and you want to hold her and hug her and kiss her. You don't want to slit her throat or throw into her crate for her entire life. And, and seeing these baby cows and, and feeling just a tiny bit of their experience, you know, I, I, the suffering I experienced vicariously from just seeing and smelling and touching them in these environments I know it's just a small, small percentage of the torment and anxiety and fear they're feeling. And if we can get people to feel even that 1%, even that 0.1% of the way the animals are feeling, then I think we can achieve change, not just in one generation, we'd achieve it overnight if we could create that sort of empathy in the human race. So Wayne, the, I think the question is, is how do we do that? Because there have been huge gains in so many social movements you i've heard you talk about it and you you've given a speech called what if everything we know about social movements is wrong right. i'd like you to delve a little bit into the animal rights movement and how it compares to other movements um 
that have had very fast change, what we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. Yeah. You know, I, I think that the errors people make relating to social movements actually aren't so different than the cognitive errors we make more generally. Psychologists have written for decades now, hundreds of years about status quo bias, right? The idea that the world is the way it is, and that's not going to change. This is a fallacy, you know, that, that if you only look at things through the lens of current norms and societies, it, it's a trap, and you can't see new frontiers and developments that are occurring and unfolding. This is true of technology. It's true of business. It's true of, of economics. It's true of, of pop culture. It's true of music. And it's true of social justice, too, and ethical movements. Um, there's, there's kind of conformity bias, you know, when you feel that other people around you have a certain perspective, even if you and your heart know something is right, you're probably not going to say much about it. And in Solomon Ash's experiments from 50 years ago, it was just the length of a line. Like people will not, they will not assess properly the length of a line that they visually can see and say line A is clearly shorter than long line B. As long as people around them are saying line B is, is the shorter line, they'll go along with the crowd. And it's like 70% of people would make mistakes that were, Mistakes that no one makes, like less than 1% of people will make these mistakes because we're highly social animals. But I think, honestly, the, the biggest bias we have is, is a bias that has gotten a lot more uh, discussion and in, in research over the last couple of decades called social desirability bias, which is about this. And it's, you know, I mean, oftentimes academics write these long papers and books about stuff that when we look at it ourselves, we're like, oh, that's common sense. Of course, that's true. And, and social desirability bias is like this, which is that and, and the basic idea behind it is in our perceptions of the world where we perceive things in a way to make ourselves feel more socially desirable. You know, we, we, it's similar to conformity bias, but conformity bias is just about, you know, other people are doing something, I'm just gonna do what they're doing. While social desirability bias delves deeper into our identity. Like we, we do not wanna identify as someone who's weird. This is just the way the world is. And even, even people who are part of weird movements or, you know, like the queer movement, for example. I mean. The queer movement has been powerful because it's normalized queerness. Like queerness is no longer weird, right? As long as you're weird, as long as you're an outsider, fundamentally, you you're, you're, you you cannot function in our society as a human being, and and so you're very unlikely to move in cognitive, perceptual, and moral directions that make you feel weird. And but it's still uh, very weird to a large percentage of the, let's just speak about the United States population. It absolutely is. And in those yeah. places, you know, you mean LGBTQ2 identity in particular. Yeah, and in those yeah, and the places- the queer movement. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I would say my parents don't even know what that is. Yeah, and no, absolutely. Yeah. And in those places, it's hard, harder to be queer. Like if you're in San Francisco mm -hmm. in the Castro, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's obviously a different sort of situation. I don't want to speak, I'm not queer myself, so I don't want to speak about that experience. But I think this is what the research shows. And I think this is, what a lot of queer folks have said, that it's easier when you're around people in the Castro than if you're in Arkansas, in rural county, right? Right. There's a big difference. And right now, the entire yeah. world is, is like being queer in, in Arkansas uh, for, for, for animals and for animal rights activists. So yeah. I think the result of this concretely is that people are very afraid to speak their truth. And, and to me, the fundamental motivating force behind DXC was we have to speak our truth. And this is an ethical claim. It's about just integrity in our own identities and our own beliefs and just in the world. We wanna live in a society and a world where people can speak their truth, can be them, themselves. And you know, I was a kid growing up in Indiana trying to be a cool kid, trying to join the football team. I never admitted to anyone that I loved animals. And then my favorite thing to do is just like hug my dog and roll around on the ground with my dog. That was like, mm -hmm. and, and play with animals. because as a 16 year old kid, frankly, even as a 39 year old man, I mean, I still feel that way, <laughs> but it's embarrassing. You know, like people say, that's kind of an embarrassing thing for a 39 year old lawyer to talk in a goofy childish voice with his dog and, <laughs> and his favorite thing to do to be like playing with his dog on, on the ground and rolling around. And, and that has deeply and insidiously affected the animal movement and our inability to speak our truth. And uh, let's be clear, I'm not saying we should judge and shame and attack. And, and that's, a, that's a thin line. It can be, it, it's hard. So sometimes, sometimes our truth is we have resentment and anger. And, and I think we have to harness our truth in a way that's positive and constructive. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you need to speak your truth. And in fact, that same gentleman who I worked with at the University of Chicago, Cass Sunstein, just wrote a book called How Change Happens. 
which is about this idea called preference falsification. Mm -hmm. Preference falsification is something that occurred in the gay rights movement, occurred in, in uh, the Me Too movement, where there's a widespread feeling people have, but because it's embarrassing in some way, they cannot talk about it openly. And despite the fact that many people share that conviction, whether it's a conviction that, you know, I should be able to marry who I want to marry. I should be able to love who I want to love. Or conviction that I should not be seen as just a object of sexual conquest in the workplace. Mm -hmm. Because it's kind of embarrassing to come out and say it, people don't say it, even though a large percent of the population actually agrees with it. And what happens in periods where we have widespread preference falsification is if you can hit a critical mass, and this is Erica Chenoweth's work. Erica Chenoweth is a political scientist at Harvard who coined the term, the rule 3.5%, that you need about 3.5% of the population engaged in active nonviolent direct action in order to achieve systemic change. But what Erica in Cass's research shows is it's a surprisingly small percentage of the population you need to start speaking out before you hit a tipping point, and then change happens very quickly. Mm -hmm. And that goes to your question about does change happen very slowly over centuries? And, and that's true. There's some truth to that. But the concrete victories that we achieve, oftentimes when you read about the accounts from activists, you look at the historical research on movements like the abolition of slavery, the civil rights movement, the women's rights movement, progress seems very, very slow over decades or even centuries. I mean, Mary Wollstonecraft wrote um, her book about women's rights in the late 18th century, like, and she was laughed at. It took, you know, well over 100 years before we got women's suffrage. It was a 150, 100, 200 year journey to get to there yeah. and, and, and a constitutional right giving women the right to vote. But when it does happen, and the right to vote is an example of this, it happens very fast because mm -hmm. all these people are suddenly coming out and saying, you know what, I do deserve the right to vote or I do deserve the right to marry who I like or I am a, 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 a human being in our society and I don't deserve to be treated with sexual contempt just because of my, my, my gender. You know, and these things happen much faster, but they happen because people start to speak their truth openly and proudly and loudly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what is it that, because uh, <clears throat> 2020 is a perfect example, George Floyd, his death, his yeah. murder, was the uh, catalyst for institutional change. I felt it. Yeah. I felt a change. I learned so much. Uh, after uh, with the Black Lives Matter movement after George Floyd. But I had been involved with protests a couple years earlier when people were in the streets. But for some reason, it was 2020 that really made the system change and probably yeah. stick. I, I believe it's going to stick. It what do you mean by system? system? The systems, meaning now we actually have systemic change. We're not just, the white people aren't just saying, oh yeah, there's discrimination where you can see it in the commercials on TV. We're actually yeah. seeing diversity. People aren't just saying it's right to be diverse. There's actually diversity. You're seeing it in schools where people are starting to teach more than just the quote unquote classics, which were all yeah. white Western men. In They're California, actually, but I would argue it's gone the other way in the South, just because you know that's where I'm from and I've spent mm. a lot of time there. And it, 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 I was there for the, when the Breonna Taylor trial was happening. It is, it's, I, I would argue that it has actually had a backlash than they are, are headed in the other direction. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's it's polarized. And right? I'm not arguing with you. I'm just like, that's, no, no. you know, it's like, I, I, I don't know. I mean, it's California for sure. You know, we're, we're feeling that change that you're speaking of. Yeah, look at what's happening in Georgia right now with the, yeah. you know, the voting so, legislation. But I think, I mean, I think this is often the way social change works too. That it's just, mm -hmm. you, you have these moments, these critical moments. There's constitutional moments where there's intense periods of, of conflict for sure and people going in different directions but that conflict also creates energy for change it's almost like you know if you look at electricity i'm not an engineer but i know there's something about the the polar differences between a positive node and electrical node that create energy for work right a battery is not just everything in the middle it's got a positive node and a negative node and something about the proton and the electron and the difference between the two of them creates this gap but then it also creates energy to push things forward and i think that's kind of what's unfolding with racial justice um and that's a painful, painful experience oftentimes. You know, it's, it's not fun to be in Georgia right now if you're black. And honestly, I'm sure it's not fun to be a Republican in Georgia. They're, everyone's feeling kind of under threat. And in time periods in the United States where we've seen massive systemic change, meaning changes to our political institutions, to our corporate governance, you know, and it is pretty shocking that Delta Airlines is coming out in support of civil rights legislation, or I should against, I should say, 
against impingements on the civil rights of people of color in Georgia. But it, it, it's, it's a painful process. It's a polarized process where you're probably right. It goes in fits and starts. And, mm -hmm. and gay rights is another example where, you know, after, after Gavin Newsom uh, enshrined gay marriage as a right and for people in San Francisco, we had Prop 8 in 2008, you know? And everyone thought, you know, we're winning, we're making progress. You had that Hawaii case in the late 1990s where a federal court said that, maybe it was a federal court, it might have been a state court, said that people have the right to marry. And then you have Prop, Prop 8, which says, no, I mean, we're going to go back the way things are. So, but yeah, yeah I mean, I, I think just to answer your question briefly, though, I'm with Zainab Tufekian on this, and she's written about how movements are not moments. We often confuse the moment with the movement, but George Floyd only happens because of amazing organizing that's happened for decades that creates that critical mass, the kindling for the movement to grow. And to me, you know, George Floyd's death and the great work that people have done around that horrible injustice was a product of a lot of barbershop conversations. It was a product of, of people chatting in their homes, chatting on Twitter. You know, Black Twitter is, is a powerful force for change. And if not for all these folks on Twitter, at home in their barbershops and colleges and universities and their workplaces and banks and tech companies talking about these issues, you don't have the critical mass you need of people coming out and saying Black Lives Matter when George Floyd is killed. And that normalized, that made it not weird. I yeah. think I, I wanted to know what you thought about the moment when animal rights is going, where are we in that not weird process? We're getting there, you know, and I think, it, you look at kind of the New York Times, which is the gray lady, the, the paper of record in this country. There have been a number of columns by some of their most prominent columnists, even in the last few months, speculating the future of the world is plant-based. The future of the world is animal rights. You have Nick Kristoff writing columns, speculating about how future generations will see the crimes against animals for what they are, you know? Um, this is, he wrote about this in the context, actually, of the George Floyd protest, because people were tearing down all these Confederate statues and saying, mm -hmm. all these things our ancestors did were horrible racial injustices, and let's tear down this statue of Robert E. Lee, let's take John Calhoun's name off of the Yale University building, and so on. And, and Christoph made, I think, the very good point that while it's very easy to look at the injustices perpetrated on innocence by our forefathers and our ancestors, it's harder to look at what, at what common mainstream injustices are being perpetrated against innocents today. And, and the first thing he said that came to his mind was what, what happens to animals. And got another guy, Frank Bruni, a columnist of the New York Times, who, you know, he's, he's written a book about, he wrote this great book called Going Round about <laughs> his struggles with health and, and, and obesity and how he overcame it. And he's not a vegetarian, you know, I mean, he eats meat from what I understand and is, is, is not interested in becoming a vegetarian or vegan, he wrote a column recently about how the burger is going extinct. You know, so I, I think we're getting near that inflection mm -hmm. point. Uh, I mean, honestly, folks like you and Dotsie, like the fact that we have Olympic athletes who are vegan is, is amazing and really important. And we're going to keep working along all these fronts culturally, sociologically, uh, medically to make sure this does become normal. So, because I think that's where the planet needs us to go. It's, that's for sure. So we have all of these, uh, you know, movements that you were um, alluding to uh, that have been, you know, arguably successful or not, but are creating energy. I love when you said that, because that, to me, that couldn't be more true, right? Like there's a, there's a catalyst of energy that people are, are, are paying attention to, whether they like it or not. Um, but all of these have to do with humans and we tend to relate to our own and it's taken us eons to even relate to the same exact human that just happens to be like a couple shades darker than we are, mm -hmm. you know, how on earth do we transfer that feeling, that energy that people caring to non-human animals when they seem so different with different noses and different feet and lots yeah. more fur and how do we get people to make that leap? Yeah. No, it's a great question. And, you know, Jennifer Eberhardt, the social psychologist at Stanford, has written about kind of the dehumanization of mm -hmm. animals and human beings. And, and right. how, you know, she's written about how, like, so for example, I'm Chinese in Northern California. And 
when the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed in 1882, I think it was, there was a lot of animalization of Chinese people. There are signs that say no dogs are Chinese people. You know, they used a different term for Chinese people, which I won't use here because it's not such a nice word. But, mm -hmm. um, and so, but there's still a, a difference. There's a gap, right? A, a Chinese person, even if they dress differently, even if they got weird hair or weird hat or look a little different, they can still communicate using the languages that we communicate with. They can still marry someone and have children with someone who's of a different race. And, and that's never going to be true. A dog's never going to be able to talk to you about the ethical arguments against animal exploitation the way a Chinese person could talk to you about the ethical arguments against discrimination against people of color. Yeah. Um, the advantage we have, in my view, is twofold. One is a lot of, of racism, if you look at the history of racism, a lot of it has to do with competitive dynamics, right? Um, there's actually just a study released today by Bob Pate, one of my former professors at the University of Chicago, finding that by far and away, the most common origin of the people who engaged in the capital riots were people who lived in surprisingly diverse communities where the white population was decreasing. You know, so it wasn't people living in completely rural white communities. It was people living in communities where white people were decreasing in number and there was some sort of competitive dynamic. Mm. And similarly, if you look at the discrimination against Chinese people in this country, which I know best because I'm Chinese and I've experienced it and I've read a lot about it historically, even to this day, but even back in the 1800s, a lot of it was they're taking our jobs. You know, they're, they're a, a threat to us. Um, and so the, and you have demagogues who use that, that perceived insecurity and threat to drum up racist fears. And, and that's what Trump did for four years, sadly. And that's what demagogues across the world have done. You look at Slobodan Milosevic in Yugoslavia, he did exactly the same thing. And it was even more astonishing in Yugoslavia because he was able to do it, even though the people all looked the same. I mean, Serbs and Bosnians and Croats all look the same. They just have different religions and they intermarried for generations. And then you've got a demagogue coming in and using fear. So we don't have that in the context of the animals. Like whatever you think about the beagle sitting behind me, not many people are going to say that's a national security threat. And people are going to say that about Chinese people. And frankly, the FBI said that about black identity extremism. If you look at kind of the FBI's records mm -hmm. of the last 50 years, they've identified black identity extremism. In other words, civil mm -hmm. rights activism <laughs> as a national <laughs> security threat, because there are a lot of people, you know, white people primarily, but some other people too, who see other races as potentially dangerous. So we don't have that. The second thing we have that Chinese people and people of color have not had is that animals are already part of our families. You know, I, you're just talking about your blind chihuahua, mm -hmm. uh, which is adorable. And I want to hear more about your blind chihuahua. But you know, again, one, one of my former mentors, Kat Sunstein, has written about this, but half of Americans, half American households have a dog or cat as a family member. And among those Americans, half of them, so about 25% of all Americans, buy birthday presents and Christmas gifts and other gifts for their companion animals. These are real family members. In 1882, or frankly, even in the year 2020, there are not that many white people who regularly buy Christmas gifts for Chinese people. And cer certainly not in 1882 in Northern California. They wanted them out of the country. They were killing them. They were killing them in big mobs. But they, they were not part of the family. And so we have a window, and a lot of us have come to this, this movement through our family relationships. I certainly did. I mean, I was just telling you before we started this call, mm -hmm. that in, in the beginning of this call, that you know, dogs have been my saviors. They, they've been my best friends, my family members. I love my dogs as much as I love my human family, and I love my human family a lot. And, and, and that I think is that's also that why gays, uh, the gay rights movement moved forward mm -hmm. too. I've heard you speak about that, Wayne. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because so many people, yeah, <laughs> wherever they family. were in the United States, even in the deep South, they had people they loved when they came out who were gay and that helped open everybody up. Is that right? Dick Cheney, two words. That, yeah. that explains to you why, why we have potential too. I mean, Dick Cheney is, you know, he's almost as grim, grim reaper, figure within progressives. I mean, I'm, I, if I was in his presence, I'd almost be a little scared. <laughs> He's, I, he, he has made decisions that have killed so many people. And, and what are, even if you like him, he's certainly not a cuddly social justice sort of guy. And Dick Cheney came out for gay rights a while back. And why is it? Well, he's got a daughter who's gay. And he loves his daughter. He loves his daughter's wife. They're good people. And, you know, like we know the animals. We know they're, they're good people. You know, like Anyone who's met a dog or adopted a dog, even people who are cruel to dogs, you know, like Michael Vick, he, he was awful to his dogs. But you, you listen to Michael Vick talk about dogs, despite the fact that he killed all those dogs. Michael Vick is a former NFL player who murdered all these dogs and was convicted of, of dog fighting. 
even he recognizes the goodness of dogs. When he talks about dogs, and this is before his conviction, after his conviction, he understands they're loyal. They love their guardians. They, they, they care deeply and they, they want to please us. They want, and they want to be happy. And he had a very different conception of happiness that was corrupted and wrong and violent. But even someone as cruel as, as Michael Vick was when he was a dog fighter understood that dogs are innocent and they're good. Mm -hmm. And so are the other animals. I'd love to talk about uh, open rescue because you started DXE and, and, and obviously that's one tactic that's a really huge part of the organization. Yeah. Uh, can, can you explain uh, in layman's terms, if you will, because I needed Please. to explain to me the first time and uh, exactly what that is, what it means and, and why it's so important. Yeah. Open rescue is the act of openly without covering your faces and documenting exactly what you're doing, mm -hmm. openly going into a place where animals are being hurt and taking the animal out, taking them to receive care. And, and to me, it is the canonical act of animal rights and animal liberation because we are bringing to life what we would like to see for the world. You know, I want to see a world where when someone sees a dog trapped in a cage moaning or spinning in circles because she's gone insane from lack of stimulation and confinement, that when they see that, they say, I want to help, right? And, and if we want the world to act that way, we want our institutions, our laws, our corporations to act that way, we have to start doing it ourselves. And the reason this is so crucial is because human beings are metaphorical animals. And throughout history, whenever there's been some social injustice, whether it's the Indian independence movement and the fact that, you know, Indian people were not even allowed to, to sell the salt that they were harvesting with their own hands. The woman suffrage movement, we were just talking about the right to vote. Susan B. Anthony was not allowed to vote, so she just went and voted. <laughs> she just did it and she got arrested for it. And there's a trial and everything. But she said, you know what? I see a world where our institutions and our system is behaving unjustly. And the best way for us to get to a just world is for me to act in a way that's just. And what is just for the animals of this earth is for us to give them love and compassion and not cruelty. And so that's what we want to do. Um, so there's all sorts of other dimensions to this though, but you know, there's a legal dimension, there's a political dimension, but the, you know, the crucial thing to me is it's, it's not just about the active rescue. It's about inspiring others to provide material support for animals too. Because when we take these risks and, and Alexandra has been part of a lot of these projects and go into factory farms and get charged and prosecuted for it, there is a, a backlash effect that is incredibly powerful. And in fact, a lot of scholars have written about this, that a huge part of what drives social change isn't even the actions themselves. It's a backlash that comes down on you and the sympathy that generates in the public. It wasn't just the marches in Birmingham that triggered progress of social justice for black Americans. It was the fact that the police dogs came after them. It wasn't just the fact that Susan B. Anthony voted, even though it was illegal to vote. It was the fact that she had a trial that at the time was on the front page of every newspaper in the country because people mm -hmm. thought, wow, this is curious. This woman who, you know, otherwise seems like such an intelligent, ordinary human being has just defied our laws in this fundamental way. Maybe we should rethink this practice that we've engaged in. And that's our hope, that it's a storytelling and campaigning that happens after the open risk. It's the backlash that is inflicted upon us, the suffering we have to endure. And it's, mm -hmm. it's not fun sometimes. I'm going through, I think, seven different trials over the next year or two. Um, yeah. How do we keep the focus on what's happening behind closed doors on the animals yeah. versus what the feds, I'm, it seems to me, are trying to do is just, just keep the focus on you guys and label you as extremists Paris. when this yeah. is completely peaceful. Although these animals are owned, that's oftentimes their argument, right? They're not your property to go take. How do we keep the focus on what's happening and not on you and your rap sheet, right? Yeah. Like that's what we need to make sure is shifting and happening. Yeah, I mean, so I'd say two things. One is, you know, as much as possible, I try to not make it about myself or the activists. Like, and in some ways, this has been a little bit of sacrifice in the sense that I try to, you know, I almost think that when you're, when you're engaged in civil disobedience, it's almost like you have to follow as many other rules as you can mm -hmm. <laughs> to show that I, I, it's not about me. It's not about me being like a rabble rousing, you know, mm -hmm. lawbreaker. You know, like I, 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 I'm a, in many ways, a deeply conservative, <laughs> rule-following Chinese kid who always did what my parents told me, you know, got good grades, never broke any rules. Um, and even just like in my personal life, like I don't, I don't drink, I don't use any drugs. I, I try to be as kind of as, as 
almost ordinary and conservative and, and <laughs> tame as possible my ordinary life so that the challenge we offer to the system in our animal rights advocacy can be clearly seen for what it is, which is a challenge of injustice, not about some, you know, like in Fox News, they're always talking about, oh, all these woke extremists, they just hate America. It's, it's not about any of that. It, it's about, let's just look exactly what's happening to the animals and ask ourselves, is this right? So that's one thing I'd say. You know, try, try to make it, make yourself as unobjectionable as possible in other regards. And don't be someone who's difficult in every way. Like, because if you're difficult in one way, it's already challenging enough. Don't be difficult yeah. in every way. Um, and that relates to our personal interactions with people too. You know, I, it's easy for me because I think my natural disposition is I'm a people pleaser. I, I like making people happy. But I also think that's strategically important that I'm someone who's a Buddhist, who does not think ill of people. Like I, I'm good friends with a factory farmer in Utah. Like I, I'm good friends with him. I genuinely like him as a person. I think what he's doing is an atrocity. He, he's, his actions are terrible and acceptable, but he's a good person. I like him. Um, and I, I'm, you know, I'm trying to have him for holiday Thanksgiving this, this, this November because I, I genuinely enjoy his company. It's going to be vegan Thanksgiving, of course, but I want, I want to have him over as a turkey farmer. Um, so that's, that's one thing. But the, the second thing is I think that uh, there is absolutely a propaganda war after civil disobedience. And we've seen this with the Black Lives Matter protests. We're seeing this with the Capitol riots. We, we've seen this with the civil rights movement, with the women's suffrage movement, and with Me Too, too. You know, you've got some people saying, oh, it's just women complaining and it's all false and Trump saying it's all just a, an effort to smear men and bring men down. And I think uh, one of the things that we have to get better at as a movement is being incredibly sophisticated in terms of communications and being able to work at the level of these large corporations that have an active interest because they've got, you know, some of the world's experts in public relations telling their stories. And, and so does the federal government for that matter. You know, the FBI has a nearly unlimited budget and they can caricature us however they like to caricature us. We have to develop a skill set in that regard. So I always say open rescue is not just about, and you support and are part of open rescue, not just because you took that animal out. If you're someone who's writing a press release a year later after a rescue has happened, you are part of open rescue and is just as crucial to have dedicated, experienced, sophisticated activists telling those stories afterwards. And we have to appreciate, understand, and invest in those folks and, and, and acknowledge them just as much as we acknowledge the people on the front lines. Mm -hmm. you're, talking, you're talking about activists. A lot of organizations focus on turning people vegan, but DXC believes more in changing systems and focusing on inspiring activists. Can you talk about that strategy? Why, why is that your strategy, Wayne, what, what about yeah. social movements um, has taught you that this is, this is more effective or uh, uh, not necessarily, I don't know if you think it's more effective, but it's the route you, that you've chosen with DXC. Yeah, I do think it's more effective. And, you know, I think there, there are two things that I'd say. Can One we is, define systems before we even dive into this? Uh, like what, it, cause there's, there's a lot of different meanings and it could yeah. mean cultural or it could mean a law. So what, yeah, in your, um, you know, how do you see systems versus like individual behavior change? Yeah, to me, a system is a rule, formal or informal. There are some rules that are written down on a piece of paper, statutes and mm -hmm. on corporate policies and so on. But then there are a set of informal rules too that we culturally understand because they're part of our popular culture. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's no law against saying racial epithets, for example, but there's still a rule against it. You know, and people face consequences for it. So that's part of the system too. And the difference between a system and individual behavior is a system lives outside of our own head, right? It's not just what's in my mind. Even if I, in my own head, decide animals are not things, we should not mistreat them. There's still a system around me that's constraining my behavior, right? So as much as I'd like to think that everyone in their heart of hearts agrees that animals are not things, and when you see an animal being hurt, you should just rescue them. There's a system that is trying to crush me for, for living out my ideals and living my truth, right? And I can try and pretend that system doesn't exist, but those rules exist. And those rules might be wrong. They might not even be in alignment with what we personally think. I think the rules on animals very much are not in alignment with what ordinary people are. I think, frankly, the rules on sexual harassment were not in alignment. You know, there were a lot of informal rules telling people, don't talk about this. Don't talk about this openly for sure, because it's embarrassing. It's shameful. And you're probably a slut if you talk about sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. those rules existed even though most people in their hearts that you know i don't like this i don't like the fact that i have to go to work every day and deal with some asshole who's touching me or saying things to me that are inappropriate 
And the same is true for animal rights. And I think if we're going to change that system, it's a different set of strategies. Like a lot of animal rights is very focused on changing someone's personal mind. But what, what matters more than what is in between someone's head and what their personal views are is the rules around them, the pieces of paper on which we write laws, the corporate policies on which employees are required to adhere to in order to continue functioning as an employee of an organization. But honestly, even all those pieces of paper are less important than a different set of beliefs. Not my personal beliefs, but my beliefs about what other people believe. Like that is what defines you. People as social animals, human beings as social animals are very much defined by not what we personally believe, but what we believe other people to believe. So even if I think bell bottoms are the sexiest, hottest thing that I could possibly wear, I am constrained by the fact that I know if I wear bell bottoms in the year 2020 instead of skinny jeans, people are gonna look at me kind of funny, but like, they're gonna think it's like some sort of retro day at a bar, <laughs> you know, but if I wore them every day, you know, I'm constrained by that system. And that's not a very important system. And it's not, I mean, I could do it. Like I, I'd face some embarrassment, but it's not the biggest deal. I'm not gonna be thrown in jail. I'm not gonna lose my job. On the yeah. other hand, what I do for animals, I could lose my freedom for, right? And, and we have to think about how we change that system. And, and how we change that is, it's not enough for me to convince one individual prosecutor, one individual meat eater to go vegan. I have to convince our entire society to reconceive of our relationship yeah. with the other animals of this earth. And for, I have a good the, example, actually, for this. Please. Personally, if I could just interject, which is something that's already happened. When I first started acting, mm -hmm. I had a couple years in, I had it into my contract. It was 1984, maybe 85, that any makeup that was used on me couldn't be tested on animals. And back mm -hmm. then, that was unheard of. And there was only one company that was touting it, and that was Mac. Uh, and makeup artists would say, oh, I don't know. Tell me. Whoa. They would be. Now, the system has changed Dang. so much that makeup that's tested on animals is actually frowned on nice. for the most part. And, that's the, and so I, I as, am able to act on my inner belief mm -hmm. so much more because the system has changed. Is that a good example, Wayne? That's a great example. And, <laughs> and it's righteous and right on. But the problem is, in 1984, Alexandra was one of the very brave, few brave people who are willing to deviate from the system. And so we've got to find ways to empower and encourage people, again, to find that truth, find that truth that they believe and empower them to speak out. Um, what do you attribute the change in cosmetics to? Like, do you think it was animal rights activism primarily that changed this? Or do you think it was people within the industry? Oh, no, it was definitely the animal rights or animal welfare, maybe even more, because there's so little justification to torture a bunny for mascara. Yeah, yeah. So the, the, um, the convenience, and also it was women. If it was men, it might have been a little different if it was a product that men use. But women definitely, I think, were able to make that, um, weigh that and come out like I'm willing for my mascara to, I, um, it was, con yeah, because compassion is what a lot of women are driven by. It's yeah. almost just like the awareness because that, that, that was enough. Whereas that awareness of your, the pig and that in that video is my pork sandwich. There's a, not, you know, the awareness is not going to make them not eat that sandwich. This was simply just like, oh, that's definitely, they, everyone saw that as messed up. Like, yeah. I don't need mascara, you know, it, it, it's like, it, it just. But if we had to give up mascara it. completely because it couldn't, there was never, there was not going to be a mascara tested on animals. I don't know if it would have, I don't know if women would have given up mascara, but because right. it was an alternative. Well, we don't two. have to give up our pork sandwich. There's plenty of alternatives. <laughs> exactly. Well, now we know. So wait, we know. go back yeah, to the. Yeah. Go back to the systems and how we need to change systems so the individuals yeah. can thrive, their beliefs can come out mm -hmm. and they can act on them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, the, so the first thing I was going to say is that the, the history and science and consumer activism, the idea that you just kind of one by one change everyone's mind and they engage in different purchasing habits. And this is the theory I was operating under circa 2004 when I was at the University of Chicago, you know, doing research in this area. There's just not a lot of evidence it works. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, you know, there, and even worse, there's some evidence that corporations actually actively encourage people down that pathway to escape more systemic interventions. Uh, I'll, I'll give you a, a concrete example from a different context. Um, the tobacco industry for, for years, you know, said that we, we cannot have regulation and we can't have any sort of political intervention because that would be against consumer choice. That really the only path forward is we got to go one by one to all these different cigarette smokers and convince them that it's bad to smoke. And 
you know, as much as I would love as a tobacco executive to shift our industry towards healthier habits, we can't do it because it's a consumer who's responsible. They place the entire blame on this system, on individual consumers who they had actively manipulated and deceived for decades. You know, there's enormous science in the 1960s and 70s about tobacco and the risk of cancer and emphysema and all these things. And they actively suppressed it. They, they yeah. convinced people that smoking was healthy. That's going to help your digestion. You know, all these things that they, they outright lied. And so they did this, this, this two-step dance where they lied to the public about how nice cigarettes were. And then they blamed the public for the fact that they continue smoking and said, you can't intervene systemically. And I think, you know, my agriculture is in a very similar place where, uh, and, you know, whatever your thoughts are on neoliberalism, I mean, neoliberalism is like the hot word right now. And everyone's complaining about neoliberalism. I don't, I don't actually have an ethical objection to the idea of neoliberalism, the idea that we can achieve change through the pocketbook and through markets. Like, I think we just have to look at the evidence and data and ask, is this actually an effective means for us to achieve change? And I, I think it's a great thing when you have a near consumer product. I love vegan education. I engage in vegan education all the time. But at the end of the day, engaging in vegan education without systemic change and without political change is like trying to swim upstream into a tsunami. <laughs> you just can't do it. It's too hard. There's too many forces constantly pushing people back in the other direction. So every vegan you convince, and I saw this through personal experience. It's like when I was convinced of this methodology, that if we just educate people and convince them to become ethical consumers, that would be enough. I handed out tens and I think possibly hundreds of thousands of leaflets on the south side of Chicago thinking, okay, we're going to convince one or 2% of people to change. This is just a numbers game. I'm going to hand out as many leaflets, show as many videos, give as many DVDs out as I possibly can. I did it every single day of my life for over two years in Chicago and handed out more leaflets than I think anyone else probably on the planet over that time period. Um, and then I did some like just, I mean, I was studying social science, so I thought, okay, let me deploy some of my social scientific expertise and do some very preliminary polling and just get a sense of how things have changed. And I saw no differences at all. In fact, there was actually, like, again, very crappy, and I'm not saying this is peer-reviewed research quality, but just very preliminary sorts of polling methods that I did in Chicago between 2004 and 2007 on the University of Chicago campus, just on one campus that I hit harder than any campus probably in the nation at that time period. And I think veganism actually went down over that time period. <laughs> what was I doing all this time? I spent so much time on this and nothing changed because nothing had changed in the system, in the cultural currents. You know, I wasn't organizing. I wasn't changing policy. I wasn't getting, you know, agendas into the student government council. I wasn't getting media coverage. I was just handing people leaflets and that wasn't enough. We had to think bigger. So that's piece one about the, the consumer activism, both of my personal experiences and the research doesn't work. But the other piece is the positive piece, which is what does work. And there is a burgeoning field of social movement research led by people like Duncan Watts, who I think I recommended his book, Everything is Obvious, which is a brilliant book. He's a, a university professor, which is the highest title possible at the University of Pennsylvania. People like Zainab Tufekci, the Turkish sociologist at the University of North Carolina, who's a New York Times columnist. People like Erica Chanel at Harvard, showing that what actually does create change is not changing people's consumption habits or economic behavior, but convincing them to get active and speak out. And when you have mobilized masses of people engaging what Erica Chenoweth calls, you know, civil resistance, um, Zainab Tufekci would probably call it uh, nonviolent direct action or nonviolent action. But when you get a significant percentage of people acting out in ways that are outside of kind of ordinary discourse and ordinary institutional behavior, and being open and public about it and trying to spread that to other people, you can create, it's, it's almost like a positive infection, right? It's, it's an infection that can spread because unlike our personal consumer behaviors, our social and political behaviors have the potential to spread wildly. And, and that was the operative theory upon which we founded DXC back in 2012. So what do you recommend for activists or I shouldn't even say activists for people who love animals and who want the way yeah. that uh, that we treat animals to change what would you tell them to do about that yeah well I, there you know I think I've always said DXC can be summarized in 10 words and I think this is also my theory of change that I give to ordinary people that they're basically three pieces if you want to understand okay I just said okay we have to build a movement of people speaking out what are the three pieces of this? And I can answer that in 10 words. Um, find your voice, find some friends, and fight like hell. Those are the 10 words, right? And that's it. 
So the first piece is if you're not someone who's comfortable speaking out and don't feel you can do it in a skillful, powerful way, then find your voice. Go to some public speaking trainings. Dare yourself to make that Facebook post that you've wanted to make for years, but you're worried that your uncle's going to get upset about it. And, and be thoughtful about it. Don't be an asshole, but speak out. Find some way to speak out in whatever way you can. If you're already in a place where you feel comfortable speaking out, of course, you should always cultivate your communication abilities. I'm not saying you should drop that entirely, but if you're already in a place where you have found your voice, find some friends. Because as powerful as you are on your own, social movements are not additive or even multiplicative functions. They're exponential functions of social networks. That two people are not twice as powerful as one person, they're like 10 times as powerful. And four people are not four times as powerful as one person, they're like 100 times as powerful. And so the more, and, and, and it has to do with the amplifying effects. And, and the way I describe this is, all of us have heard speakers and microphones in a feedback cycle, right? And a very small initial sound in an amplifying cycle, like a microphone and a speaker can suddenly become cacophonous to the point you can't even hear anything, right? And the same is true of social movements. When you're around other people who can amplify your voice, support and encourage you, give you feedback, make you stronger, it becomes an exponentially more powerful movement. So find some friends if you're alone. And even if you're already, I'm connected to a lot of people. I'm friends of you, friends of Dati now. I'm always trying to find more connections. And, you know, it's, it's the old lesson you get from your, your grandfather when you go to school or, you know, get an MBA. Like, go network. Networking turns out mm -hmm. to be pretty important, unfortunately. It's like one of the, the old lessons our, our elders tell us that is actually true. You got to network. And then finally, fight like hell, right? And, and I think the key part of this is anytime you're fighting, and I don't mean obviously necessarily a physical fight. But anytime you're in a fight, you understand two far, there are two parts of any fight. One is there's an adversary. And I'm not saying that adversary is an enemy or a villain necessarily, but there's an adversary. And understand that if you're not running into any opposition, you're probably not doing social movement activism. There's going to be opposition. Mm -hmm. but the second part of a fight is any fight worth fighting is going to be hard at times. So understand that you're going into something where there is going to be opposition and there's going to be struggle. And that is part of the change. Don't, don't feel bad about it. Don't, don't go home and cry about it because, or you can cry about it. That, yeah. that sometimes is a good reaction. I mean, I'm not saying don't cry about it, but don't, don't cry about it in a way that makes you give up. Yeah. Understand when you're getting into this, that that is the nature of activism. Beyond that, there are all sorts of great activism. Podcasting is great activism. And if you're doing great podcasting, sometimes there's going to be a fight that you have to fight. There's going to be opposition and there's going to be struggle. Right. Um, but, but, Every type of nonviolent direct action that is actually effective is a fight of some sort in that regard. Because if you're not triggering the opposition, you're probably not doing anything that matters. And if you're not struggling at all personally, then you're probably not pushing yourself hard enough. And part of what you need to do to create systemic change is push beyond the boundaries that ordinary people are, are confined by. Yeah. And that's hard. Even Martin Luther King, when he wanted to march in Birmingham, correct me if I'm wrong, Wayne, he was the more conservative clerics who were black. Yeah. Um, they thought he was going too far yeah. and were worried. Mm -hmm. um, but it was, so can you talk a little bit to yeah. that? Uh, why Absolutely. that it's so important to make other people uncomfortable? And I too am a people pleaser. So that's yeah. why, that's where your friends come in, your community, because they Absolutely. help you um, feel not so alone when yeah, and eventually, people are, disagree with you. And eventually the goal that King had and the goal I have is to make your adversaries your friends. You know, we, I want mm -hmm. that factory farmer to eventually sell off his business or, or frankly, even better, shut it down. Don't even sell it. Don't sell it to someone else. Just shut the place down, make it a sanctuary instead. And I told them this. I've said, yeah. I envision a world where you're making plant-based turkey meats, no human being or animal has to suffer, and you're even richer than you were before. I would love mm -hmm. that. That's my goal for you. I'm I want the best for you and I want the best for your children. And if we continue killing animals the way we're killing them, your children are going to suffer. This is, this is not good for you. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that the, the letter from a Birmingham jail is honestly, it, if you haven't read it, just turn off this podcast right now. You don't need to listen to me anymore. I'm not as smart as King or as eloquent. Just go read King. And it's, it is shocking to me how few people actually understand the historical context of the civil rights of Martin Luther King, King Jr. I mean, it's as John Lewis said, John Lewis has said many times, King was not just an activist, he was a revolutionary. And it takes that people with that sort of mindset sometimes to create change, at least when we need systemic change. If we're just reforming things in the margins, yeah, you, you don't need a revolutionary. But, but King was someone who dared to do things that led him to be assassinated. There's a reason for that. Because he was going up against forces, it was a fight. 
you know, it wasn't a violent fight for him at least. Um, for him, it was a nonviolent fight. For the other people on the other side, it was very much a violent fight. And what he writes in that letter is that there are all these folks who say they're for our cause, but they don't agree with our tactics. And they don't understand that that is part of the problem. The fact that a country that was founded on a revolution, that, that we were founded on the idea that there's no taxation without representation. If we don't have democracy, we will fight and die for that. And the fact that you do not understand why the black people in this country feel the same urgency to fight and even die for our right to vote, our right to be represented, to be seen as citizens of this country, that is part of the problem. Like, and and it's, it's not that you don't believe it, because if, if I sat down and had an intellectual conversation with some of these more moderate civil rights activists, they probably would have said, yeah, I mean, and I'm not saying you don't want to go too far in the other direction and say that civil disobedience is the only tool in the toolkit and you should always use it in all contexts. And you don't want to escalate to harshness always. And I think, you know, King had a great theory on this, which is you start with self-purification. First, make sure, and this is kind of what I was saying earlier in the podcast about trying to be a high integrity person. Like, I'm not saying you should, if you drink or do drugs, you shouldn't do activism. Do activism if you drink. But that, for me, that was for me what I needed to do. Um, but, but he said, start with self-purification and, and, and then do research into the issue, then negotiate with the other party, and then you go to direct action, right? That's when you engage in the fight. But you, you show people through the actions you've taken up till, until that point that it is the last available alternative. And frankly, when we're facing the sixth mass extinction, when trillions upon trillions of animals in the wild and in factory farms are dying, when wildfires are burning our homes down, and our climate is changing so rapidly that we may not have a planet for our children. We don't have any available alternatives any longer and we cannot wait any longer. Greta is absolutely right about this. We need to fight now. And it has to be a fight if we're gonna win. I wanna just ask one more question before we go so that our audience knows where we're going. Can you, can you define animal liberation? Maybe talk about Rose's Law? Yeah. Where, where should we be aiming in terms of animals? Animal liberation, as defined by Peter Singer, again, a, a guy who's much smarter and more accomplished than me and has a, a shorter rap sheet too, is, is a very simple concept. It is the idea that regardless of your species, you deserve to be equally considered by our society. You know? And it's, it's, that is a dramatic claim, right? But it's the same claim that women made in the 1700s. Mary Wollstonecraft, you know, when she wrote... Um, I don't remember the name. It was something like on the emancipation of women. It's the same claim that civil rights activists made that, that King made in, in the 1960s. It's the same claim that LGBTQ people have made over the last few decades, that I deserve to be treated with equal consideration. Uh, it doesn't mean, contrary to what a lot of people think, it doesn't necessarily mean that they get exactly the same things that we want. You know, like for a human being, the right to vote is quite important. I don't think Julie, the beagle behind me, really cares that much about the right to vote or needs the right to vote, but she does deserve to be treated with dignity and respect as a fellow sentient being on this planet. And beyond that, the specifics are really up to us to fill. You know, so you see mostly right-wingers, but some progressives too, laughing about all the ridiculous things we want to do for animals. Oh, you want to give dogs the right to marry and, you know, all these things. And it's like, I, I, as long as society is animated by that basic principle in the same way that, you know, the founding father of this country had certain rights that they thought were foundational rights. And from that bill of rights, we've expanded beyond that to fill in the gaps over the last couple of centuries. Similarly, what we need is a foundational political, legal and ethical and social principle that regardless of whether you have four legs or two, whether you have four on your back or bare skin, whether you have wings or arms, everyone deserves to be treated with decency, respect, and compassion. If we start with that foundational principle, all the other politics and laws work themselves out. And I think that's what we need to get. And specifically, you know, Rose's Law is a campaign DXC has been working on to try to enshrine this, first at the local level, just enshrine this very basic political principle, um, not dissimilar to what Hawaii did with gay marriage, you know, it wasn't, or what Gavin Newsom did with gay marriage, you know, in the early 2000s, where he said, you know what, the state and the federal government are saying this is illegal. I'm just going to do it. And, and it was achieving that at the local level that opened the floodgates for systemic national, eventually international change in all these movements. And we want to do the same in one jurisdiction for, for animal liberation. Wayne, thank you so much for being on the show. You sure. are so inspirational. And I, 
am so honored to be your friend and uh, I've learned so much from you. So thank you. And now Dotsie gets to know you and be yes. uh, your friend too, which was my goal all along. Awesome. Well, right and back I like at you. To, um, I, 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 Alexander thinks I'm going to let her off, but in his, as short or as long as you want, Alexander, I want, I need your favorite Wayne story. <laughs> I need. <sighs> I tried to get her to do this at the beginning, but she's, <laughs> but well, people want to know, I mean, this, an experience, whether it was an open rescue or whether it was a cup of coffee together and you learned something that changed your life from him. Just, um, okay. Well, there's so many, but, well, okay. So I was at a slaughterhouse in Oakland and um, Wayne, you were the spokesperson, I think. And I just remember that when I was taken out of the slaughterhouse and um, in handcuffs, you were already in handcuffs. You were wearing, uh, Wayne always wears a, a tie, a white shirt and a jacket to show respect. Um, and just because it's, you know, he's a spokesperson and the leader usually of these, these demos. And he was being um, put into the car, but he was talking and ex so eloquently as he was being led by this policeman about why we were here. And I couldn't, I w I'm not nearly as articulate, but he's able to just the vision of him being, you know, his head pushed down into the police car, uh, put, uh, his hands behind his back uh, in handcuffs, wearing this really great suit and talking about rights and liberation and justice. And the policeman is not caring, but um, there are, there, it's, it's very inspirational. Just wow. that's, that's how I think of Wayne, in a shirt yeah. and tie, jacket, in cuffs, um, and also, but also continually talking on behalf of animals. Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, and some of them good. do listen because at that particular action, that was one of our first sit-ins at a slaughterhouse where we had a few dozen people just sit peacefully with flowers in their hands at a slaughterhouse. I mean, literally a few feet away from the animal where the animals are being slaughtered. One of the officers, because they had stopped us from moving one of the animals and like a bunch of the employees had stopped us, one of the officers, officers actually liberated an animal. He, he, he wasn't sure what to do. He didn't want to force the people to take the animal back to the slaughterhouse. So he actually said, what can I do? And he, he paid for the animal to be released. So he went wow. to the company and said, I really don't want to arrest them. Can I just pay you? And can you let them go? And that's what happened. You know, one of the animals literally got out alive because an officer paid for them to be released. Can I, I'm going to just briefly tell Alexa, my favorite Alexander story. We talked <laughs> oh, a little bit no. about racial justice. <laughs> um, the way I know Alexander is because before we were anything, before we had done any open rescues, before anyone knew who the hell we were, before Alexander even knew anything about me. Alexandra was the one who really inspired us to make diversity and racial justice a big part of what DXC was doing. Because I was at a time where I was feeling pretty defeated on racial justice. You know, Chinese people get a lot of crap in the animal rights movement, um, you know, because, you know, there's a lot of awful stuff happening in China. And I'd kind of given up and we had tried to get a racial justice symposium about how we can most effectively advocate in Chinatowns, for example, which I think white people make a lot of mistakes in going to Chinatown and not understanding the cultural dynamics. Yeah. And I've basically given up and said, you know what, there's way too much backlash. I can't do this. And Alexandra like came to our talk, listened to it, really supported us. Came, and that was the first time I met her. And that really convinced me. I was like at the point of giving up <laughs> on that stuff. And, and the, the thing that you provide, and this is just as important to direct action as people on the front lines, although you do front lines work too, is, Alexandra is just, and I'm sure you've experienced this, Dotsie, she is so incredibly supportive of everyone, but especially people who are down and out, people who, you know, now I feel like I have a lot of influence and power, but back then I didn't. And Alexandra has always had a heart for the little guy. And, and that's what we were back in 2013. And I attribute a lot of our successes to the fact that we didn't give up on that. And we continued to cultivate leaders like Priya and Tanya and these people of color who over the years have been able to show we have what it takes to be incredible advocates for animals. And that might not have happened if we hadn't gotten your support and encouragement, oh, Alexander. Wayne, I share that you. feeling with you. I mean, I'm still here doing what I'm doing because of her support. I would have quit probably by now. Yeah. You are absolutely is. amazing. <laughs> she <laughs> is. You are. I love that you guys shared those stories. It's going to be the best part of the podcast. <laughs> oh my gosh. I just want to say that I, uh, you two are amazing. And when I saw Wayne and Priya talk about um, diversity in the animal rights movement, I was just like, oh my gosh, 
I, part of me had never, I knew it, but I hadn't seen it. And then, then I started seeing it everywhere, how white we are. And that's one of the beautiful things about direct action everywhere is how diverse it is. Direct action everywhere and probably the animal save movement here in LA are the most diverse animal organizations in the United States uh, from what I have seen. And it's, it's huge. It's huge, including people, all sorts of people and opening it up. So anyway, yeah. thank you. I could go on and on <laughs> about both of you. <laughs> thank you, Wayne. This yeah. is a treasure. My pleasure. Hey, folks. Okay. Back by very popular demand is our plant-powered plate fridge magnet, which you are going to receive for free if you leave us a rating and a review on whatever platform you're listening to this podcast on. So here are the details. Just write your quick review. Does not need to be long. Does not need to be a whole story. Just be honest and speak from the heart. Then take a quick screenshot of the review you wrote and email it to us at podcast at switchforgood.org. That's podcast at switchforgood.org. And include your mailing address so we can send you a power plate. We are doing this because the more reviews we garner, the higher we go in search results, which means more folks will learn about our podcast. So the power is in your hands. Leave us a review and zoom, zoom, your power plate arrives at your doorstep. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.